What's up, Creekside? How you doing? You guys doing good? Oh, hey, it's good to be with you this morning. I'm excited. I'm going to be teaching on giving, on generosity. And, um, you know, I thought, what better way for us to start than to tell the story of an elderly woman, a widowed woman, that exemplified generosity. Now, before you get upset, it's fictitious, okay? It's a fake story, and um, if you do get offended by it, it's only a joke, but feel free to email myself, uh, Pastor Eric at creeksidecb.org. There you go. So there was a small little country church, and the pastor wanted to raise money to be able to buy the church a new piano. And so the pastor had this idea. He's like, you know what? We should have a fundraising competition. And whoever gives the most money, they can pick their favorite hymn to be played on the new piano. He thought this is a great idea, okay? And so they decided to announce it to the church, and they did this fundraising competition. And the Sunday service finally finally showed up for who they were going to announce the winner. And it was an elderly widowed woman. She donated a thousand dollars. Very generous of her, right? And so in the service, they announced, they said, sister, you've won the competition. Feel free. Would you like to pick out your favorite hymn? So she stood up without any hesitation, and she pointed at the young man in the crowd and said, I pick him. Well, <laughs> Granny was a cougar, you know what I'm saying? No. All jokes aside, all jokes aside. We're currently going through a sermon series titled, What If? And we've been thinking about the role of the church, the big C church and our little C church here at Creekside. What would it look like? What if the church lived out its calling? What if the church lived out its divine purpose in the earth? And so today, my message is centered around one of our core values here at Creekside, which is you can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. So we're going to be talking about giving this morning. And I know before you roll your eyes at me, oh, another pastor talking about giving and he just wants my money. Before you do all that, listen, I think it's important to mention that while giving, it certainly involves money, but it's a lot bigger than money. In fact, my sermon today is not actually about tithing, although I think it is impossible to talk about how you can't outgive God without mentioning it, right? So I'm going to be reading a lot of Bible today. Do you guys love the Bible? See, it's, it's kind of a trick question because that means I've got a lot of Bible to give you, okay? When I read, uh, I gave the media team my slides the other day, and I felt like Jules had a heart attack. It was insane. But don't worry, we had a resurrection. Hallelujah. There was some healing in the house. But, but yeah, so I'm going to go through a lot of biblical texts. We're going to have a lot of scripture to unpack. But to try and simplify things, to not make it confusing, I've decided to divide my sermon into just these three main points and these three main categories. So point number one, and I'm going to give it to you all at the front. God is generous and loves to bless. Point number two, we are blessed. Oh, come on. I know someone likes that one. And then point number three, we are called to bless others. So let's look at this first main point that God is generous and loves to bless. And in Matthew chapter 7, we're gonna, that's going to be our first reading this morning. We like to stand for the reading of God's Word. Would you stand with us this morning? In Matthew 7, Jesus, he encourages his disciples to ask and seek God in prayer. So let's read this together. We're starting in verse, uh, let's see, verse 7 here. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. 
and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Listen to how Jesus illustrates this explanation by revealing how God is generous. Verse 11, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I mean, just think about that. If there are good earthly dads, then how much greater is our heavenly Father? If in this room today, if there are some generous fathers, there's some generous dads here today, just think of how much more generous is God the Father. Now, when we teach on tithing, we look at this passage in Malachi chapter 3. It, it gets quoted a lot. Um, and I want, to, I want us to look at this passage this morning. But I want you to pay close attention to how it reveals that God is the one who loves to bless. I think for me anyways, when I read this Malachi 3.10 verse, a lot of times I think about what it's asking me to do. What does it say about me? But this morning, I want you to hear this passage with, with new ears today and think of what it's saying about God. Malachi 3.10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. God is a God who blesses. Of course, God is generous. I mean, what kind of person tells you to love your enemies? What kind of person says to bless those that curse you, to bless those who persecute you? But that's what Jesus taught. Isn't that the most direct example of generosity? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 and 45 says, Jesus said, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Notice that God causes the sun to rise on both evil and good, that he sends his rain on both the just and the unjust, his mercies are new every morning, and I really believe that each day is a gift from God. I mean, sometimes I wonder, like, how could God be so patient with me? Like, why would God give me a second chance? Like, I know my past. I know my story. I know the sins that I've had in my life. But yet he gives me an, a new day each day, and his mercies are new every morning. But it's important for you to hear this, that it's not because of how good I am. It's not because of how good you are, but it's because of how good he is. It's because of how good God is. Even when it comes to his mercy and grace, you just can't outgive God. God is so generous. Okay, I want us to look at that second point, that we are blessed. Come on, that's the one. We are blessed. You guys know that song? Uh, it's uh, old Fred Hammond. Any gospel fans? We're blessed in the city. No? Okay. That's your homework. Go home and look up that song. I like to jam out to that in the car. But we are blessed. God has blessed his people. And as believers, we can walk in all the blessings that God has for us. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says this. If you don't have this one highlighted in your Bible, come on, you got to highlight this one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing 
in the heavenly places. Come on, someone say every. That's right. If you're ever having a bad day, you should just remind yourself of that one verse, that Christ has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, to really unpack this and to illustrate this point more, I want us to look at the story of Balak and Balaam. Now, this story is in the book of Numbers, and it goes from chapters 22 to chapter 24. And I'm not going to be able to read it all today because it does cover so much text. So I would encourage you, if you want to go home and read from 22 to 24, definitely do it. But today in my message, I've decided for us to just focus on and really divided the scriptures so that we can have uh, just something to concentrate on. And so I've decided to choose the four oracles of Balaam. So to simplify the story, and I'm going to have some paraphrased parts, but basically what happens is King Balak, who is afraid of Israel, he hires a witch. Now, I guess it depends on who you ask. You could maybe also say a pagan seer, but I'm just going to call it what it is. It's a witch. Pastor Eric's like, it's a witch. <laughs> so King Balak, he hires uh, Balaam, who's a witch, to put a curse on Israel. But no matter how hard he tries, Balaam can only speak what the Lord tells him to share. So to give us more biblical context, I'm going to start our reading in chapter 22, starting with verse 1. Then the people of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab, beyond the Jordan at Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, now when I see that, I just, I can't help but think Zipper. It's just, it's a, it's a funny name. He probably should have just zipped it, you know what I mean? Like, zip. Yeah. <laughs> So Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was in great dread of the people, because they were many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, This horde will now lick up all that is around us, as the ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was king of Moab, at that time sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the Ema, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they are dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land. For I know that whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. I think maybe that was one of his first problems there. He was thinking that, oh, if I put my faith in Balaam, then he can curse these people, right? He was putting his trust in Balaam, but you got to know that whoever God has blessed is blessed. Verse 7, so the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. So Balak the king sends some of his princes to hire Balaam to place a curse on God's people. But look at this, what God tells Balaam to do in verse 12. God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, go to your own land. For the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said to him, Balaam refuses to come with us. Now after Balaam refused to go, Balak sent more of his princes with more higher honor to try and bring Balaam. And this time, after waiting the night, Balaam decides to go in the morning and rides his donkey. God says, sends an angel to warn Balaam, but at first only the donkey can see the angel. Now, some of you may be familiar with the story because God causes the donkey to speak. So after three times of the donkey refusing to move forward, because again, the donkey is seeing the angel of the Lord, which, he can, which uh, Balaam can't see, 
Well, God finally opens the mouth of the donkey in verse 28. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Before I go on, you, know, you just got to think like with the Holy Spirit, God can do whatever. It makes the donkey even speak. Isn't that wild? So then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me? these three times. Now again, as Balaam's riding, the donkey doesn't go forward because of the angel, so uh, Balaam ended up striking the donkey three times. Verse 29, and Balaam said to the donkey, because you have made a fool of me, I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. And the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he said, no. Verse 31, then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed down and fell on his face. Then the angel of the Lord, he, he gives this warning to Balaam in verse 35. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but speak only the word that I tell you. So Balaam went on with the princes of Balak. So King Balak, he tries to have Balaam curse Israel four different times. But remember, each time, Balaam can only say what God has told him to say. So this is where we get into the four oracles of Balaam. This is the first oracle in Numbers chapter 23. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. And he returned to him, and behold, he and all the princes of Moab were standing beside his burnt offering. Can you imagine this? They're all there. They're so excited. They're like, yeah, he's going to do it. He's going to bring the curse down. They're all gathered around. But verse 7, And Balaam took up his discourse and said, From Aram, Balak has brought me the king of Moab from the eastern mountains. Come curse Jacob for me and come denounce Israel. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the cracks, crags I see him. From the hills I behold him. Behold a people dwelling alone and not counting itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright, and let my end be like his. Balak is furious that Balaam decided to bless instead of curse. So he figures, okay, well, let's try a different location. Maybe if I take you to a different place, maybe then you'll be able to curse. Verse 13, And Balak said to him, Please come with me to another place from which you may see them. You shall see only a fraction of them and shall not see them all. Then curse them for me from there. Well, here's what Balaam's second oracle was. Verse 18. And Balaam took up his discourse and said, Rise, Balak, and hear. Give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Behold, I received a command to bless. He is blessed, and I cannot revoke it. He has not beheld misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord their God is with them, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt and is for them like the horns of the wild ox. For there is no enchantment against Jacob, no divination against Israel. Now it shall be said of Jacob and Israel, What has God wrought? Behold a people as a lioness. It rises up, and as a lion it lifts itself. It does not lie down until it has devoured the prey and drunk the blood of the slain. You would think he would give up, right? No, he, he hasn't got the memo yet. Balak tries again, verse 27. And Balak said to Balaam, Come now, 
I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them for me from there. But in chapter 24, we see this. When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go, as at other times, to look for omens, but set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe. And the Spirit of God came upon him. Oh, you know, sometimes it's those people that are the furthest away from God. The one that you don't think can have it. The one that you think are too, too far gone. That's a whole nother sermon. That's a whole nother sermon. But the Spirit of God comes upon him. And he took up his discourse and said, the oracle of Balaam, son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered, how lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel, like palm groves that stretch afar, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt, and his for him like the horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations, his adversaries, and shall break their bones in pieces and pierce them through with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down like a lion, and like a lioness, who will, rise, who will rouse him up? Blessed are those who bless you, and cursed are those who curse you. Balaam would go on with a fourth and, and a final oracle, which it ends chapter 24, when he ultimately prophesies of how Israel would bring judgment to Moab. And again, I can't read it all today because we're on limited time. But I would encourage you to read it at home. And now you, some of you might be thinking, well, this is, you know, a cool story and all. But what does it have to do with my life? This story, it teaches us the simple lesson that you can't curse what God has already blessed. And we, as the children of God, bought by the blood of Jesus, you are in fact blessed no matter what the economy looks like no matter what your bank account looks like you are blessed he took jesus took on the cross the curse so that you would be blessed now i remember when i was getting ready to move overseas to marry dari we got married in in south korea and I had to get all of my baggage in order. Now, some of you are like, oh, yeah, his suitcases. No, I'm talking a, a different kind of baggage. <laughs> talking about the issues of my life. And also, you know, literal baggage, too. But I had uh, I ended up, so we didn't really know when we were going to be reunited again. Uh, we first met in Korea. We knew we wanted to get married. But we didn't know, like, how long this process was going to take. I had just made Dari a promise no matter how long it takes, I'll come back and I'll marry you. So it ended up taking about a year. And over the course of a year, I just was, again, trying to get everything in order in my life. And uh, I had watched a, a video. And it came up on my For You page on Instagram. And it was this uh, preacher. And he said something along the lines of, God wants more for you than what you want for yourself. And he encouraged his viewers to write down a list of all the things that they wanted and to take it to God in prayer by faith. Now, to this day, I have no idea who this, this preacher was. Still don't know, don't know his name or anything. But I was inspired by what he said, so I made a list of things. And some of them were pretty important. So I wrote down this list, and one of those was, pay off 13, over $13,000 in debt. Like, that's kind of a good idea. If you're going to move overseas, you should probably pay off your debt. Like, that's, that's pretty smart. And some other things were pretty important, too. Like, how about having some cash, having some savings? And so 
literally I wrote down only have $1,000 ready to go. That's it. Now, some of them were kind of silly things, or they maybe sound silly to you, but they were just sentimental, important for me. I mean, if you're getting married, like some people, they want to have a fancy wedding gown, and, and they spend a lot of money on that, or, or maybe they want to have a nice reception, and so they spend a lot of money on that. Well, for Dari and I, um, a few things on my list were uh, fragrances. So I love fragrances. Um, I'm a big cologne person. And so I wanted to wear, on our wedding day, I wanted to wear um, Creed Asian Green Tea, which is, you know, we're in Korea, right? So it's this fragrance that's actually made with green tea. Okay, I won't geek out anymore. But so, <laughs> so yeah, there's like fragrances on the list, like presents, you know, watches, things like that on this list. And um, basically, within less than a year, before I moved and before I flew over to Seoul, not only paid off the $13,000 of debt, but I was able to save over $8,000 in cash. The fragrances, clones, and watches, all of it, bought each of those things. And I'm not saying it like it was credit to me, like no, it wasn't because of me, but I believe it was because I believe that you can't outgive God. And I believe that God wanted more for me than what I even wanted for myself. Now, this isn't a, like a prosperity message. I'm not saying, hey, I need a private jet. Let's, let's pass around the buckets, right? <laughs> no. In fact, being blessed, it doesn't mean that we're doing it just to like store up these treasures. I mean, Jesus re flat out rebukes that, not to store up your treasures on earth. But instead, he gives us these blessings, which transitions me to my, my final point, which is that we are called to bless others. As the blessed of the Lord, we are called to bless others. You know, there was a man who once had a lot of blessings. In fact, he had a lot of wealth. He seeked salvation, and he asked Jesus, well, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus asked him, well, have you followed all of the law and all of the prophets? And I think the man may have been blind blind by his own sin, because he's like, yes, I have. Ha ha, I have obeyed all of that. <laughs> well, Jesus told him, and catch this, he didn't tell him to tithe, give 10%. No, but he told him, give 100%. He told him to sell all of his possessions and give it to the poor. I know sometimes as Christians, we get hung up on the whole tithing thing. But you got to hear it. God's not after 10%. He's after 100%. He doesn't just want 10% of your heart. He wants 100% of your heart. I don't have this one in my, my notes, but in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul said that God gives seed to the sower. He gives seed to the sower. Now, some people think, oh, that means, okay, I don't have enough seed. I can't sow. Huh? Sorry, God. God didn't give me enough seed. I guess I don't have to give. No, it says he provides seed to the sower. It's to the one that's sowing. He, he provides seed. So I believe that as you give and as you trust God with the little things, if you're faithful with the little things, God will trust you with more. Now, he's blessed us so richly in Christ not so that we can just have all of these cool things, right? But he's called us to care for those that are in need. I'm going to do a, a little illustration here. Bread. Who likes bread? Yeah. <laughs> so Henry Nowen... Um, he was one of my favorite authors, and he, amazing man of God, left a huge legacy and impacted so many lives. And he used to do this illustration with bread. And what he would try to do is he would try to illustrate what Jesus was doing when he fed the 5,000, when he multiplied the food. 
Or he would, when Jesus sat with his disciples at the Last Supper and broke bread. And so this part, hun, could you come up, actually? I forgot. It's kind of hard to do with, with one hand. She says I got to pay her later for this. All right, so Jesus, he would take the bread. He would bless the bread. He would break the bread. And then he would give the bread. He would take it. He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it. And Henry Nouwen would say, and we are also taken, blessed, broken, and given. Thank you. Give it up for my wife. <laughs> God has blessed us, and you can't outgive God. But we have to remember that he has given us so much so that we can be a blessing to others. Because we are given for others. We are broken for others. I wonder today, what would it look like if we live lives that are taken, blessed, broken, and given? And I remember the first time I saw real, real extreme poverty. I was in the Philippines and I saw young children, like six years old, sleeping on the streets homeless, begging for food, begging for money. I mean, I remember it just, it wrecked me. I remember when I came back and I landed at Minneapolis airport, I called my dad and, and I just bawled on the phone, you know, just crying. Because it was, it was so overwhelming, especially going from there to here and seeing just the differences, you know. I remember even when I was in the Philippines, we got, we got ripped off one time by a rickshaw driver. So uh, kind of got stolen from by him. And I don't know how to explain what a rickshaw is, but it's kind of like a ghetto taxi, I guess, right? That's maybe the best way of putting it. So he's like, you know, motor, driving a motorcycle, and then we're in the little carriage behind him. And he basically just shorted us change. So it was supposed to cost a little bit. I gave him some money, and he was, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have any change. Don't have anything to give you. Sorry. And, and drove off like that. And in the moment, we were so frustrated. We're upset and heated and like, oh, my gosh, this guy just stole money from us. And then all of a sudden, I was like, how much was it? I asked Dari, can you, like, convert it? Because it's a different currency. And she's like, 10 bucks. You know, $10. And I was like, okay, well, he can have it. <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. And for us, you know, it's not a lot of money right? But for some people around the world, that's more than a day wage. For some people, that's a lot of money. I remember also met a pastor there. His name is Pastor Joey, amazing man of God. He was one of those street kids that he grew up as a street kid, and, and then now today he got saved, and he rescues those kids from the streets, and he's planted two different churches, and if you go to his church, you find that the street kids are the members. They've, been, they've grown up and have been discipled. And I'm just, you know, I'm hanging around this guy, and I'm like, wow, this is like being by a Bible character. I'm like, this guy's faith is insane. And I just thought, man, this is so cool to be around him. And I remember he shared with me that he lives off of only $15 a week. That's his pay. When I came back, just all of this, it overwhelmed me. I felt like, why God? Why them? Why not me? You know, and it just, it, I, the only way I could describe it is like, it just overwhelmed me. Just all of the, the trouble in the world, all of the poverty, all of it was so overwhelming. I didn't even know if I could pray. It just, it felt so heavy. And I eventually, I called one of my old pastor friends, and he shared with me, he's like, you know, you don't need to be ashamed that you're American. You don't need to be ashamed that you have all of these blessings because God has given you all of these things so that you can be a blessing to others. That's the truth. 
So I want us to recap. Today we studied the theme that you can't outgive God. We asked the question, what would it look like if the church not just believed this truth, but what if we actually lived it out? And remember, we centered our talk today around those three biblical truths that God is generous and loves to bless, that we are blessed and we are called to bless others. So my prayer today is that when we, when we finally leave, when we finish the service and we go home, that we would be challenged today that we would leave challenged to live generous lives inspired by God's own generosity. As we, go out into, as we go out into the world, let's embody the love and generosity that we have received. We can become vessels. We can become instruments of blessing to those that are around us. Let our actions, especially, hey, if you're going to lunch after this and you have a waitress, let our actions speak of God's abundant grace. May our lives reflect his endless generosity. And remember that when we give of ourselves, we mirror the heart of God. We make his love known in a tangible way. So when we go out, may we be a blessing and watch how God's generosity flows through you to transform lives. Before we leave, I want to invite up our worship team. And I just want to give you an opportunity to respond. You know, the Holy Spirit may be tugging on your heart. And, you know, this is a safe place, and we want to give you an opportunity to respond. Maybe you're like, you know, I need to step out in faith today. How many of you would say, I don't want to give God just a little bit of my heart, but I want to give him 100% of my heart? Is that you in this place? Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song, and it's one we sang earlier about making room, about giving God the space to do whatever he wants to. I wonder what it would look like today if we made space for Jesus in our heart. I wonder today if, if that could be your prayer. Would you stand with us? I want to invite our deacons forward. And so our deacons are amazing men and women of God that are anointed. I mean, they are such incredible people. And they are anointed prayer partners. And I want to encourage you, if you raise your hand, if there's a reason that you need to come forward, a reason for why you need prayer today, if you're hearing me talking about giving and living a generous life, but you're thinking, my goodness, it's so hard to, with the grocery, with the grocery prices and everything that's going on, I, I understand. But I want to encourage you to come and get prayer today. So Lord, God, I just pray for those that this message is speaking to to those that feel, Lord, like it is hard to give, like it is hard to live out this life. Maybe they're in the part where it feels like they've been broken. God, I just pray today that you would give them faith. Lord, you would give them faith to come forward, to receive from you. Holy Spirit, would you move in this place today? In Jesus' name. Now, I do want to encourage you, church, if that was you, if you feel like, man, I need to come forward. I know sometimes it's intimidating, but you know what? These moments right here are life-changing. These moments are powerful. These moments, there's breakthrough. So, God, we just pray you would move today, Lord. In Jesus' name.